amazing energy in this room, and I, I'm really proud of all the women who are here, and I'm also proud of all the men who are here, so I think we shouldn't forget that they're also important, okay? So, <laughs> because the university where I come from, and I think you will uh, sympathize with that, uh, to have women in science is almost the exception. Now, Imperial College is uh, a university for science and technology, and I can only encourage all these amazing women in this room to come and join us and bring this energy to our departments, where still far too many departments are led by men. So so anyway, I want to talk about um, uh, Ada Lovelace today, and I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for what I do as a doctor, which is medicine is not in STEM, but sciences, and how you can possibly try and bring these things together. And when I was thinking about this, I really don't know much about the Ada Lovelace mathematic, mathematic formula, etc. That's really sort of way beyond me. So I was thinking about how can I relate to Ada with something that I have a background in, and that happens to be medicine. And when I started reading about her biography, I realized that she has got quite a history in not being quite so well. In fact, it said she spent most of her childhood sick. Now, I'm a pediatrician, right? If someone tells me they spend most of their life, uh, childhood sick, I want to know what happened there. So I imagined what would have been the case if I had been a pediatrician in 1815, and how would that be different as a clinician scientist in a global sense today? And that's what I want to share with you. So first thing I thought, if I had been a pediatrician at that time, this is what I would have had to look like. So it would have been slightly scary. <laughs> so I move on from that very quickly. But... You know, could we have prevented her illnesses with the knowledge that we have about science and medicine these days? So the first thing I need to say is I think she had a really difficult start because she was meant to be a boy. Now, that's the first thing. Secondly, her mother walked away from her father when she was one month old and uh, literally brought her up by herself, but was also quite a busy woman and not too keen on her mother duties. And, uh, you know... You could almost uh, think that she had a degree of emotional neglect, but she came through all of that, so she must have been a fairly resilient uh, young girl already. She also was never at school. Of course, she had all these fancy tutors, so I think homeschooling worked really well for her. And uh, the other thing is, when she was 18, she got married, and then she had three children in the space of three and a half years. Now, that takes it out on women. And when you look through her biography, actually, you can see the impact of also being a mother on the way that she could advance her sciences. So the first disease that kind of came up was she suffered from headaches that obscured her vision. So I thought, oh, she must have been suffering from migraine. But more importantly, she had a couple of preventable illnesses, and I want to tell you what we could do for these illnesses today. So there was a statement on, of course, the first thing you look up is Wikipedia, when you haven't had the time to read a proper book. Ada suffered... <laughs> Ada suffered from measles, and then it said she was paralyzed for a year. I thought, how is this possible? So actually, you know, measles is quite a dangerous disease. Who in this room has had the measles? Okay, quite a few people. Who's had the measles vaccine? Great. Okay, so because if you haven't had the measles vaccine and you get in contact with a person with measles, out of one person can infect 90 people, and out of those 90 people, about seven will get some serious complications. And that's precisely what happened to Ada, because she got what's called encephalitis. And I've got a scan here for you of the brain. So encephalitis is an inflammation in the head that can really upset your, your balance, your intellectual capabilities, and can... Well, as they say, paralyzed her for a year. I don't think it was quite so bad, but I think because everybody was so worried about her, they didn't let her get up. So um, here's a normal brain, which is a, a CT scan, and here you see all these white blotches. So that's what the disease of measles can do to your brain. And out of uh, 100 people who might get measles, there might even be one or, or 1,000 kids who get measles. One or two might die. So now we have a vaccine, right? So we're now 200 years later, we've made this great vaccine, and measles remains still a cause of major morbidity and mortality. And about every year, there's about 92,000 children that die. And here's just a map of where these vaccines uh, are not so efficiently used, so there's still the measles. 
So out of 9.2 million children who die every year, here's a big pie chart of all the diseases that children under five might die in the world, and 9.2 million children is quite a lot if you think about it. You know, it's like the entire population of London and a bit more. 1% um, of them will die of measles. So that's still 92,000 kids a year that die of a disease that you can prevent by a vaccine, right? So the type of vaccine that we use for the measles is called a life attenuated vaccine. I don't really want to go through all of this, but I thought I'd impart you some medical knowledge so that you also can take that home. And there is um, actually a global action plan to bring vaccines to children who don't get the vaccines and for diseases that can be prevented. And I just wanted to give you this vision that there is a way that no child in the world, in principle, would have to suffer what Ada suffered in 1829 or whenever it was. So, um, and there is a group of people who work in what's called the Gavi Alliance, who make sure that these vaccines are also affordable for people in countries uh, where otherwise healthcare is a bit of a problem. And this is where I want to bring you to the other place where I work when I don't spend my time at Imperial College, which is in a small country in West Africa called the Gambia. And it's embedded in uh, sort of literally within Senegal there. It's a sort of small stretch of country, is about 500 kilometers long. And if you were a person in their 60s in the Gambia, the chances are you wouldn't even be alive anymore. So there are plenty of children, so we have plenty of issues with diseases we need to prevent for these children. And I just want to show you a few pictures from the field, so you've got a vague idea of what that might look like. You have plenty of women and children lining up for vaccine clinics. Everybody comes along. There's sort of slight chaos sometimes, but ultimately people get seen and hopefully they get some sort of health care. And what we can do in these settings is that we can assess who gets the vaccine, who doesn't get the vaccine, who does the vaccine work for, who doesn't it work for, because we have some facilities there which are actually paid for by the Medical Research Council to bring uh, science or samples to the lab and then analyze them and bring the results back to the, to the field. And this is what we've done together with the Gambian vaccine program, that we've tested a whole bunch of vaccines, and many of them are available to all of you and your siblings and uh, future generations in this room. And um, if you want to learn more about the institution, there's the web link. So on the other hand, not everybody gets the vaccine. It's there, but for measles, for example, it's only 74%. So there will still be children who will be dying of measles, not because we don't have the vaccine, but we haven't figured out how to get it to people. And for example, there's a really cool new idea now that vaccines, because they need these cold chains, they get transported on the back of Coca-Cola vans. Can you believe it? Because they have the ultimate cold chain. So it's a bit sort of dramatic that you have to have Coca-Cola in there in order to get the vaccine to people. But anyway, at least it works. So the question is, why did Ada get this complication? And the honest answer is no idea because nobody can figure out when you have a disease, well, for some diseases, why do you get a complication and your neighbor and the other part of people in the city don't? And so how can we find this out? Because this is one of the questions that uh, as a pediatrician or as a doctor in general, people come to you and say, you know, why did I get this? You know, why didn't, you know, why was I more susceptible? And the other thing is that she also had, so that's the other thing you always do in medicine, you always take a history, and you find out that she had a half-sister who died at the age of five. So there the question is, is it because there's something weird going on in that family and some people had more of a chance of dying? And how is that possible? Is there a cause? Was it just bad luck? And is this a family that is prone to infectious diseases? And how can we find out? So new tools in science make this possible for us. And here's just a, a fancy picture that I've pulled out from a paper that we've written uh, that tells you which genes in your body are up and down regulated for certain diseases. So you can take a sample of blood, you can put it in the lab, you array it on what's called a microarray, which measures literally the expression of proteins from your blood, and it gives you this picture, and anything green is up-regulated, anything red is down-regulated, and you can find a specific pattern for a specific disease, and you could do that for people who've had complications and compare them to the background. So that's one tool. The other tool that you might have heard about is called the 100,000 Genome Project. And in this project, there is uh, an amazing attempt to do genetic sequencing for people who've had certain complications, either from infectious diseases or from cancers, and you can find some details. 
So uh, if you were a family or a person affected by a particular disease, you could uh, volunteer to, to donate your blood so that the gene expression and the 100,000 genome people could find out maybe what was particularly special about you and your family. That doesn't yet give you a therapy, but at least it gives you an idea which pathways might be involved in you having a particular complication. So but just back to uh, Ada's sister, here I found this graph which shows what the mortality was like in ch for children under the age of five between 1800 and 2013. So you can see here that there's been, this is the curve for, for the 18, uh, 1800s, and this is the curve more or less for today. So you can see that there's an enormous amount of progress has been made in children not dying of, of various diseases, and vaccines have a lot to do with that. And if you look at mortality in the 60s and you compare it to 2015, in England at the moment, of every 1,000 children, uh, four die. That's still four too many. But it used to be 27 only about 50 years ago. So there's quite some progress. But, you know, we're not done with it. The next thing that I found in Ada's biography was that she died of uterine cancer at the age of 36. Now, that was really unusual, and I didn't believe that diagnosis. So I dug a little bit deeper, and I found that, in fact, she didn't die of uterine cancer. She died of cervical cancer. Who has ever heard of cervical cancer? Great. And who's had the HPV vaccine? Yes, girls all get the HPV vaccine. It would be even better if the boys could get it as well. So cervical cancer, yeah, here we go. Applause for the HPV vaccine. So the human papilloma virus is the virus that causes uh, uh, this particular uh, type of cancer. And here's a sort of spectrum of that's a normal cervix. That's if you have some low-grade changes and so on. Um, what is really amazing is now that we have a vaccine that is very likely to prevent this condition. And we need to roll that vaccine out, and we need to also make it available to people in developing countries. Because at the moment, this vaccine is still very expensive. But with the help of this Gavi coalition, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccines, the prices have come crashing down. And Gavi, in fact, has a real effort of trying to bring these sorts of vaccines, where we already know there's about 84% effectiveness, to other areas in the world. And cervical cancer is a major cause of women's death in Africa as well. It's a big cause of death in, in uh, Europe and, um, and America. But you can see here that even in, in Eastern Africa, 25 per 100,000, that's a huge number of women, uh, will die of cervical cancer because there's no vaccine and there's also no screening program. We are in the fortunate position that we can go for these screening tests uh, in, in our settings, but there are many people out there in developing countries for whom that's not available. And I think Ada Lovelace should also be a day where we remember that not all women in all settings are as fortunate, although we all still you know, have to push for things, to get access to tools that should be available to women anywhere in the world. So how is this vaccine made? Um, it's a vaccine that uses what's called virus-like particles. And basically, you take the DNA of a piece of the, the virus from the uh, human papilloma virus, and you insert it into a yeast cell. So there's some other organisms that are very useful to um, combine, and uh, yeast cells are very cheap, and they keep on multiplying, and then you can uh, literally harvest your vaccine product and uh, can stick it in into uh, an adjuvant. But we also know that not all vaccines work equally well for all children in all settings. And there are such things as vaccine failures. There are things where, um, for example, the polio vaccine works very well in Europe, but doesn't work so well in, in India. And what can we do to find out why that is the case? And so there is a new piece of science which actually will uh, generate some uh, discussion with the other people here in the room who also care about numbers and systems, and where I will bring the story back to, to Ada. It's called systems vaccinology. So here you don't just look at the antibody, which is the classic thing you look in uh, once you use the vaccine. You also look at the genomic expression, the transcriptome, the way that the body reacts um, in terms of forming metabolites and proteins. And you can stick this all together because it might be the reason why the polio vaccine doesn't work so well in India might be because people in India have different bugs in their gut. And when the polio virus uh, vaccine gets given to them, it doesn't induce quite the same immune response. So there's this whole system now where these pieces of information can be stuck together and uh, we can learn from biology, technology 
and computation. And computation has become more and more important in science. And I couldn't run my laboratory now without having bioinformaticians, without having people who can uh, generate this incredible chip technology, without having chemical engineers, in fact. And how can you get involved? Well, you can become a scientist or a researcher. You can become a research participant. And bringing it back to Ada, we want to talk about her achievements and not just her illnesses. I think Ada had not just the foresight to think about the, uh, the machine, uh, Badger's machine, in the context of what other things could be done, but I think, in fact, she was already a pioneer of what is now called machine learning. Because, as she often pointed out, actually programming something inevitably lets one do more exploration of it. And this is where the science is these days, between medical science and basic science and computation. And we need women being involved in medicine, in the computational side, and in the basic sciences to bring together this system. And uh, I invite you all to join that. And thank you.